All right, all right. So um, we're going to have a couple of minutes of chaos as we jump into Jeremiah 6 here because we're going to give away this $25 gift card to Chick-fil-A. I hope you like Chick-fil-A. Right now you can't eat inside, but you can get it to go. And, um, and if you want to, you can just hold on to a card until, you, until you're able to use it. Um, but you had a little homework. If you'd like to participate, that's fine. For some of you, you may have already known how to do this because your homework said all you have to do if you'd like to do this is to, to learn how to spell your name, your first name, um, in sign language. And um, on the back of that page, if you're able to see it, um, it showed the, how to do each letter. And so rather than going one by one, I'm going to ask you to do something. Again, I trust you. So I'm going to ask if you'd like to participate right now and you want to demonstrate your sign language abilities to spell your name, um, your name will go in the bowl. We'll do this for a minute. You can do it towards your screen or you can do it towards someone in the same room you're in and show them that how to spell your name. And then um, after a moment, I'll say, all right, how many of you did this? And if you did it, you just raise your hand and I'll put your name in this bowl right here and we'll shake it around and we're going to draw a name out real quick. This does apply to Jeremiah 6. This isn't just some random thing to do. And, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So are you ready? You can do it towards each other or you can do it towards your screen. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. yep. well, Mark, say go. Okay. You know, I would, somebody's barking their name. That's really good. <laughs> That's bonus points. <laughs> I want to take that segment with no sound and just put it on social media and say, what in the world's happening here? And everybody's going like this. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you, how, um, how many of you actually did that just now? Raise your hand if you spelled your name uh, with sign language. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll tell you what, the easiest way for me to do this, I've got the, uh, everyone's names here, um, is to ask you, did you do it? Brenda Fowler, did you do it? No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, Let me know. That's okay if you didn't. How about Francis? Is Francis Jurgen there? Yes, but I didn't do it. Okay. The Pilkingtons are not here today. Susan Willis not here. Phyllis Moody, did you do it? I did. All right. Did. We'll you... We are witnesses. Okay. Did she do it? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Francis Charlton, did you do it? No. <laughs> I didn't Your name's kind of long, isn't it? <laughs> It Kathy. is. Kathy, I know you did it. <laughs> June Winfrey. You did? I don't oh you're muted. Just say thumbs up. Yes? Okay, good. Um uh, Marshall Hall. No. Marshall? No. And then Margie Hall. Y'all y'all were gonna y'all um your your paperwork wouldn't work on your computer, I understand. All right, I'm so sorry. Let's see, I don't see the Daniels here today. Um, Raleigh Bannister, does he happen to be with you, Gail? No. All right, we're not going to give he's him playing, He's playing with the electrician right now. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Which is why I was late. <laughs> Mike Winfrey, did he, was he there? He's not with you today, is he? Vince Webb, did Vince do it? No. Vince's hands are dirty. He didn't want to mess up. Um, <laughs> Gail, were you able to? Yep. All right, got Gail. Joyce Hollowell, I saw, I believe Hi. I saw you doing it. Margaret Bailey, no. is she in there? No, no, Margaret's away today. She's out of town today. All right, now, did I miss somebody that did it? Peggy. Peggy. Wait, I got your name, Peggy. Actually, uh, about 40 years ago, I used to help interpret for a friend of mine that we went to church with. Um, and but I've lost it. Hartwell did very well. He could interpret the whole sermon. What? Wow. How did he in the world did he do a whole sermon? Yeah, he could. All right, Peggy, I think I left your name on my desk. You and Hartwell. He did it. She understood. Every now and then she'd slap his hand and tell him he didn't do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy, I put your name on that one right there because I left yours okay. on my desk. Yours and Hartwell's actually. Did Hartwell do it too? No. Okay. Not this time. You know, I started. I started thinking about this about how people do sign language for our pastors, 
who are preaching. And I thought, man, what would it be like for someone to do sign language to Marty Dupree? Oh. <laughs> I love Marty. He's one of my best friends. And when he preaches, yeah. my ears have to pay close attention because yeah. he, he has a lot to say in, in, a, in, in um, he can put more message in a short amount of time than anybody else I know. And I, I bet some, some hands were cramped trying to do sign language. Didn't they do that in Haiti? Sign language? I thought it was somewhere that they had to slow down and maybe they only did it verbally. That was interpreter, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you had to say a sentence and stop. Say a sentence and stop. Yeah, and that's it hard was to tough. Do. That's hard to do. Some, Some people, people have a gas pedal, 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 pedal to break. All right, so I can just put all your names. Willie Dawson did it earlier, and Priscilla Webb did it earlier. So I've got everybody's names in this bowl right here. And um, I'm stirring them up. I want you to see, I'm not cheating here. I didn't put my name in there. <laughs> put that one out. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick two at random, and then you get to pick the last one. So which one should I choose, this name or that name? <coughs> this name or that name? The one with the wedding band. Yeah, that, yeah, one that, that one. That one. All right. That's good. Let's see who wins. Whoops, come here. Who do we have here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> June Winfrey, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you have such a short name. I feel like you somebody <laughs> name. It wasn't very challenging. <laughs> I'll give you bonus points for Winfrey. How about that? Yeah. Try Bannister. <laughs> <laughs> Bannister, that's right. Well, um, there's a reason for that. June, I will either put this card in the mail for you or if, my, if one of y'all are here on campus, I can hand it to you personally. Which would you prefer? I will see you on campus. All right. That's good. I hope you guys enjoy a little Chick-fil-A date there. Thank you. We um, will. One of the things, you know, when I was reading through Jeremiah 6, there's a description of the people of Judah there that made me think about someone who has – does not have the capability of hearing, um, whether it was over time or whether someone who was born deaf. And what a challenge that must, must really be um, for everything to never hear or to, to not be able to hear anymore and to have to learn to communicate through, through sign language. And um, we've got a young lady here who graduated with a degree in sign language and, and is going into that kind of that field, um, which is amazing. But there's an incredible way to communicate with sign language, but the challenge is difficult. But what I started thinking is the way that God describes the people of Judah is that they are willfully closing their ears to what he's trying to say. They're choosing to be deaf, choosing not to have um, the capability to hear with their heart, to hear from the Lord, and they're rejecting him. And I thought, who in their right mind would choose to be deaf physically? I don't know. I don't think that would be something that someone would, you know, would choose. I can't think of a circumstance that someone would choose to be deaf unless there was some extreme circumstance like, you know, you had massive noises in your ears and the only way to do it is to sever that nerve or something. I don't mean all that. I'm just saying there are normal circumstances that, that uh, choose to be deaf. And yet that's what the Judah, Judahites were doing um, when they were choosing to reject hearing from God. And so like the previous five chapters, chapter six is, is another chapter where God is actually moving from um, Judah, you need to be, you need to repent, you need to repent. He's moving from that kind of a message to here's the judgment that's coming. There is a price to pay for your, for your rebellion. And, um, and what's true for the people of Judah and Jerusalem, it's not like they're, they're isolated and God only wanted to punish them, he didn't want to, but God was choosing, um, to, they, they brought his judgment upon himself, but that's not us anymore. The truth is we all deserve the judgment of God because of our sin and our rebellion against God. And, um, and, and thankfully, Jesus took that burden, that, that um, judgment of God for our sin upon himself on the cross. He took this for us. So when we look back in time, you can see that God's heart is broken over the sin of his people in Judah, just like it was over the people in Israel in the northern kingdom. And his heart's broken over the sin of all mankind across all time. 
But as far he, he did something out of his mercy and grace, and that's when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, so when we read this passage, understand, I hope you see and hear the heart of God in this, um, that his heart is broken and, and they are bringing his judgment upon themselves. So let's read, because Jeremiah here, Jeremiah's heart's broken as well. He's a constant purveyor of bad news, knowing that the people of God are not going to respond. God's already revealed this. He's calling them to repentance, and they're choosing not to repent. And so we're going to read chapter 6. And the first 15 verses, let's look at that. But I want you to see the very first three verses. These are a, um, a declaration of war is what's happening here. Uh, so let's just read these first three verses in chapter 6 of Jeremiah. My version of ESV says, Jeremiah's writing here, he's, pre he's preached this message. Flee for safety, O people of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Now, I want to give a little quiz here and give bonus points for anybody that can tell me, where is Jeremiah from? Because it's been a few weeks since we talked about that. Um, he's not, he didn't, he wasn't born in Jerusalem. He lived a little bit outside of Jerusalem. Does anybody happen to remember the name of that little place? It starts with an A. Priscilla's, Priscilla's digging back to find it, isn't she? Uh, is it Abgar? No. Okay. Uh, Anathoth. Anathoth, that's right. Anathoth. Anathoth was about three miles north of Jerusalem. So it's just outside the shadows of Jerusalem, basically. But that's, and it was in the tribal land of Benjamin. And that's why it says here, flee for safety, O people of Benjamin. He's telling his own neighbors. <laughs> That there's there's something bad coming that you need to you need to flee from Jerusalem. If you're from Benjamin, if you're from Anathoth, get out of Jerusalem because it's going to be terrible. And he's warning his own neighbors. And then he, he continues, blow the trumpet in Tekoa, which was another place in Judah, south of Jerusalem, um, about halfway to Bethlehem. And he's saying, blow the trumpet there. And what he's saying is, announce this because there's there's destruction that's coming. Um, and it says, and raise a signal on Beth Hakarim. And raise a signal is, is, um, is, is a signal fire. It's, it's a warning through the, the smoke. Let everybody know that trouble's coming. That's the way they actually got military information. You know, they didn't have cell phones and radios. And so they use these methods to announce um, the, the military strategy or to, or to flee or to, or to hunker down. And he's saying, pay attention to the trumpet. But then as we continue on, here's what he says. For disaster looms out of the north and great destruction. The lovely and delicate bread I will destroy, the daughter of Zion. He's talking about Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. Shepherds with their flocks shall come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her, around Jerusalem. They shall pasture each in his place. He's talking about the soldiers of Babylon. And he's using an analogy here. And he's saying they're going to come against um, even in the fields all around Jerusalem, they're going to come around and, and destroy Jerusalem. Verse 4 says, prepare for war against her. Uh, arise and let us attack at noon. Again, he's talking to the, as if um, the Babylonians here are preparing for war against Jerusalem. This isn't talking about Jerusalem attacking the Babylonians. It's talking about the Babylonians attacking Jerusalem as God's destruction and judgment is coming. Attack at noon, he says, woe to us for the day declines, for the shadows of evening lengthen. Arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces. But then notice the first part of verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts. Don't miss that right there. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. For thus says the Lord of hosts. Cut down our trees, cast up a siege mound against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. What do you, what do you take it? What, what stands out to you? What does it mean? The very beginning of verse six, where he says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, and then gives this instruction on what's to happen at Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Is God, is God causing this? Mm -hmm. He's given the commands. He's he's orchestrating even the 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 destruction of Jerusalem, the wrath against Jerusalem, um, and this is by this is by his hand of as as judgment towards Jerusalem. 
Now, the Babylonians are not held innocent in this. It's not like that. God, we couldn't, we didn't have a choice. He knows the hearts of man and he knows that there was destruction. He uses the Babylonians' evil intent to bring about his destruction to the um, people of Jerusalem for their evil rebellion against him. But don't miss that God's not out of control here. God is in control here. Um, he's, he's good. He's merciful. But he's also, he's also holy. He doesn't, he doesn't stop being holy to demonstrate mercy. And he doesn't stop being mercy to demonstrate, merciful to demonstrate judgment. These are characteristics of, of God, character traits, and they belong to him all the time. So he's always 100% he's always holy and always 100% merciful. So how does, he, how does he bring wrath? Because he is holy. Well, how is that merciful? Because in that wrath, he also sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bear the wrath of all of our sins. Um, but if he just, uh, God, God is not, we've had a little bit of discussion in our home recently about um, the judgment of God and, you know, could God have chose, chosen another way than, than Christ having to die for our sin? And the reality is, there, there, if there was another way, I believe, this is me talking, if there's another way, I think he would have chosen it, but he could not have because Sin required uh, um, death. Sin required blood death. And the death of my, if I died, I have to die for my sin, but I can't die for yours. So it required the death of one who was sinless and one who was holy. And there was only one who could come and do that. And that was the son of, son of God, Jesus Christ. Well, Ron, it was not like these people had not been warned and warned that God had told, you know, he had told them over and over and he had begged and begged and he'd send Jeremiah and, and uh, God don't make quick judgments, but he does get enough of enough. There's, there's enough scripture that tells us, I'm through with this now, I'm sending your judgment. His mercy had been happening for generations. To Absolutely. To repent. That's right. You're right, Margie. That's a great insight. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like uh, spanking a child, you know, the first time you, you say, now, all right, if you do that again, I'm going to spank you. You know, you don't do it. He does it again. You do it again. <laughs> he does it again. <laughs> and after a while, you know, you, you, you got, mom don't want to do this, you know, but, but now you're making me. And uh, it's kind of like God does the same, you know, he said, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't be obedient. Yeah. It's going to be judgment. You know, we learn a lot about God through parenting, don't we? Yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> and aren't you thankful for a Heavenly Father who is good all the time? And, and, yeah. Um, but you're right. You're right. And he continued to show his mercy in reaching out and saying, repent, repent, repent. And he gave word pictures all through Jeremiah's message of saying, this is who you are. This is what's going to happen. And he's at the point now in this message, okay, this, this judgment is coming. Um, verse seven, he says, as a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Jeremiah, Jeremiah saying Jerusalem just continues to be evil, not fresh water, but what's fresh in her is the evil that she keeps doing. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Verse eight, be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you desolation an uninhabited land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall Glean thoroughly. He's talking about the Babylonians that are coming. This is how thorough this destruction is going to be. They shall glean thoroughly as a vine, the remnant of Israel, like a grape gatherer, pass your hand again over its branches. So it wasn't just going to be all, you know, well, some will be attacked and some wouldn't. It was going to be a complete thorough gleaning of Jerusalem. Verse 10, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They can't listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They don't take pleasure in, it, in his word. Therefore, I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary and holding it in, is what Jeremiah is saying. Therefore, I'm full of the wrath of the Lord. I'm weary of holding it in. Pour it out upon the children in the street and upon the gatherings of young men also. Listen how thorough it is. Both husband and wife shall be taken. The elderly and the very aged, 
Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and their wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. From the least, excuse me, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. I, if, if there was anybody that could read that or hear that message preached or read that um, passage there and walk away thinking, well, is there a loophole in this somewhere? Could there be possible that I could be spared in this? I don't know how they would walk away from that because this is such a thorough um, description of the destruction that was to come. Um, I asked you on, you know, on your study guide, what war strategies do you read about that God's going to orchestrate through the Babylonians? And um, what did you see in there? What are some of the strategies or a strategy? Just one of the strategies that you saw, what was going to happen? what did you see or hear? We kind of talked about some of it already. Everything. One of them that's clear is that God is not going to stop them. God is <laughs> them do this. So therefore, not going to interfere at all. Uh, that's right. It's going to be very thorough, and, they're, and, and he's not going to stop them. Somebody else got ready to say something, too. I thought, I thought I heard a voice. Uh, it was mine, but I've already forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. I've seen your moment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was going to be very, you're right, it's going to be very thorough. And, and there should have been no question at this point from any inhabitant of Jerusalem or Judah um, at this message that God was, that God was going to allow this to happen and, and orchestrate this to happen as his judgment. He tells them what to do. I mean, when he says, he's telling, actually, he's instructing the Babylonians, even in this message, he's instructing them what to do. Make a surprise attack at noon. Y'all in broad daylight. This wasn't going to be something they sneak in at night and attack. It was going to be in broad daylight and, and you know, the beginning of the heat of the day. Um, and they were going to continue to attack so much so and then continue to attack into the night. You know, we read, we read about that. Even through the night, the night's going to be lengthened. So this was going to be terrible. Um, they were going to continue to take, they take possession of the houses and of the fields. They take possession of, of the wives. They were, they were slaughtering and separating um, people. He said, you know, chop down the trees of, of Jerusalem and build up ramps or siege mounds outside the walls of Jerusalem. So these, he's, here's the what that's going to happen. And he also gives the why and the how. Why? Well, he said, Jerusalem, you're like a well that pours out filthy water. I don't know if you've ever drank water that's filthy or dirty. Um, I hope not on purpose, but he said, you are, you are just like a well that has it's, it's toxic water. You're, you're not, it's not fit to drink. Um, and you're like a, a terminally ill person with an infectious disease who there's no help for. And then he, he um, says how the Babylonians are gonna do it with precision and thoroughness. It's like going through the vineyard and getting all the grapes, and then they're going to send them back through the vineyard and get any lingering grapes. It's going to be that thorough to where the gleaners were going to come through and, and, and clean out everything. Not going to miss any fruit. And Jeremiah's heart is so heavy in proclaiming this message. This is not a message that he's just uh, echoing with not, with, um, you know, that he's, he's separated from at all. He's, he's, He's from Judah. He's from Anathoth. And these are his people. And he's trying to call his people back. And in verse 10, he says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? And interesting way he describes this. Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. And they cannot listen. Back in um, chapter 4, we talked. He gave a message that their hearts were uncircumcised. And, and, and that means they were not set apart. They were not consecrated for God. And, and now that's led to their ears even being uncircumcised in a sense that they are not listening to God and they're actively rebelling against God. They're committed 
to not hearing God. I don't know if you ever had a child when you were talking or you know, maybe you did this when you were a child. You may do it now. I don't know, but you cover up your ears when someone's talking. You just go, la, 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 la. You are committed to not hearing what that person's saying. That's kind of what I do. And, you know, when I, when I walk in a room and the news is on, I'm going to go, la, 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 I'm not listening, I'm not listening. Well, that's their hearts towards God. He had sent Jeremiah. He had sent prophets for years to tell them to repent. And they're over there. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. And because of that, there's this wrath that's coming. Um, in the very next session that we're going to read, section, um, there's going to be a guilty verdict that is, is proclaimed here. God is going to proclaim, Judah, you are you're guilty. It's like the charges have been brought before me, and you were declared uh, guilty in, in this, and, and beginning in verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it. And find rest for your souls. He's saying, someone, I sent prophets to proclaim this message. I sent a messenger to proclaim this. To, to look for the good way and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But notice what, what they did. Verse 16 at the end. But they said, we're not going to walk in it. <laughs> God's saying, go this way. I'm showing you the way. And they're, they're saying, no, we're not going that way. Verse 17, I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the, the sound of the trumpet. But they said, no, we're not, we're not paying attention. La, 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 I'm not paying attention. <laughs> Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth. Who's, who's the audience right here? Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone is going to be a witness. It's, it's not going to happen in a vacuum that nobody around knows. Everybody's going to see what's going to be happening in Jerusalem because of their unfaithfulness to God. Here, O earth, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. This is the crucial or the center point. Um, the, the focus of all of chapter six is in this passage right here in verse 19. The second half, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. He's saying, you are guilty of this right here. Verse 20, what used to me is frankincense, frankincense that comes from Sheba, or sweet cane from a distant land. Your burnt offerings, they're not acceptable to me. Oh, excuse me, they're not acceptable. Your nor your sacrifice is pleasing to me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will lay before this people stumbling blocks against her, which they shall stumble. Fathers and sons together, neighbor and friend, shall perish. In two more verses, thus says the Lord, Behold, a people is coming from a north country. A great nation is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. They low, that, excuse me, they hold on the bow and javelin. They are cruel and have no mercy. The sound of them is like a roaring sea. They ride on horses, set in array as a man for battle against you, O daughter of Zion. <coughs> Notice at the beginning of that section in verse 16 and beyond, um, he, he keeps pointing to the resistance of his people. They, they, they're not determined not to walk in his way. They're determined not to listen to the prophets who were to come from Moses on. They were determined not to listen. So he gives this twofold guilty verdict that the people were guilty of shunning God's law, rejecting his law, as well as shunning his word through his messengers. And yet he says, it indicates they continue to bring frankincense as an as a as a um, as an act of worship. They continue to make sacrifices in the temple on the Sabbath. I mean, there's there's still things that are, are happening in 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 practice, but their hearts are not in it. And he knows this, and he's saying they're being hypocritical in their worship because their hearts are far from them. Their lips may be close, but their hearts are far from from the Lord. Is that just a, is that just something that could only happen in the Old Testament? Not, you, you know the answer to that. Of course not. That's something that can happen today. How does that happen today? What? How can someone today um, bring hypocritical worship before the Lord? Don't name names. <laughs> <laughs> 
if you do, you name mine because I'm capable of doing just that. But how? What are examples of the way someone can be hypocritical in their worship of God today? The best definition I found of that was observance to outward forms without the inward reality of a right relationship with God. So going in, going to church, doing your Bible study or whatever, but you really don't have a relationship with God. That's, a, that's an, an example of hypocritical worship. That's right. Thank Anyone you. Anyone else? People can um, twist or use scriptures that that fit what they want it, the way they want them to fit. Um, that's true. Uh -huh. Take God's word and, and make it mean something that he didn't intend. Yeah, yeah, that fits the situation instead of the other way around. Yeah, yeah we can do that. We can mm -hmm. sure do that. Mm -hmm. Um, our worship should be indicative of, of a, it begins in our heart. Actually, our, our outward worship should come from a heart that's, that mm -hmm. seeks to worship. And with our heart to worship, that means we're uh, in a spirit of confession and repentance, of surrender, of, of faith in God, uh, of gratitude for, for, for God and all that he does. But that's gratitude, our praise of God. And that's, that's where we can worship outwardly because it starts right here in our hearts um it doesn't start with our lips it starts with our hearts mm -hmm. the rest of chapter six these last few verses is a twofold message um jeremiah describes the fearful results of judah's sins um and also jeremiah explains that god's hand has worked through the babylonians here let's read and you'll hear you'll hear some of the consequences of their sins beginning in verse 24 we have heard the report of it our hands have our hands fall helpless. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as a woman of uh, as of a woman in labor. Go not out into the field, nor walk in the road, for the enemy has a sword. And this right here, terror is on every side. O daughter of my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation, for suddenly, the destroyer will come before us. Have you, have you ever heard the phrase scared stiff? <laughs> so frightened that you can't even move or so frightened that you just pass out. Yeah. Um, some people do that when they walk up on a snake or for me, it's a spider, you know, a big spider. I, I walked into a web the other day and I backed up and there's a spider hanging in it. And I was like, oh, it's like I took my knees out from under me because I'm terrified of spiders. Hate them. Well, that's what, he's, that's what he's saying here um, for, for the Judah. He said, this is going to be so um, horrible and so destructive. It's going to come on you seemingly so sudden, even though I've given you warning after warning after warning. You're going to be much like a woman that's suddenly in labor and, and terror is on every side. Your hands are going to fall helpless. There is nothing that you're going to be able to do. Verse 27, he said, I made you a tester of my, um, Metals among my people. He's talking to um, Jeremiah here. I've made you a tester of metals among my people that you may know and test their ways. You're going to see what I've been saying is what God's saying. You will see what I know about their hearts. They're all stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They are bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. The bellows blow fiercely. It's, he's using a metallurgy um, example here. Someone that's heating metal up and getting the fire so high and, 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 and sweeping away the dross that comes to the top, the impurities. Um, he's saying the bellows, they blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire in vain. This refining goes on for the wicked are not removed. Rejected silver, they are called for the Lord has rejected them. That when this process that would normally purify would happen, um, you would be left with, with refined precious metal. But for what's happening here with the, the judgment that's coming, everything is going to be removed. Everything is dross because of, of their hearts that, that they've rebelled against God so thoroughly. And verse 30, reject, um, rejected silver, they are called. That's the two words um, that they're described as here, rejected silver. You know, over in Matthew 7, um, when, when Jesus speaks of 
the judgment and he speaks of lost the people who even the religious lost people people who are hypocritical in this in the sense that they've shown outward expressions of worship but they had no inward relationship with god at all and they said lord we did all these things in your name and you remember i'm sure you've read seven you've done these things we've we've done all these things in your name we've healed people we've cast out demons we've done all these things in your name and in, that, in verse um, 21, Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, from, from the, coming from the mouth of Jesus, saying these words. I can't imagine anything more horrible to hear coming from the mouth of the Savior. Depart from me, I never knew you. And that's what's happening here in verse 30. Rejected silver, they're called, for the Lord has rejected them because they had rejected God. And now he is rejecting them. There is no hope for them because of in, in the judgment of God. Now, I want you to know, there is hope today. <laughs> We're not closing this in prayer and saying, so there's no more hope. There is hope. We know, because we are looking back on this, we know that God was had not um, completely eradicated his people and and, and that's the end of it, because if that was the end of it, then the world would have been eradicated too. But we know that Jesus was coming, that God was going to send his son, that people could be redeemed. He would have a remnant, and, um, and through the remnant of the, the tribe of Israel, or the, the Israel through the King David's lineage, that the Messiah was going to be born. But here in this part, in this short section of history that we're reading about in, in chapter 6, um, God is saying this judgment is going to be very thorough and I'm rejecting Israel because they rejected me for so long. We know in other chapters and we'll see in other chapters as well where he then points out, but there is hope. There is mercy. We saw this um, early on. That's why the very fact that God called Jeremiah to proclaim this message is an act of his mercy that the people would repent. I guess my encouragement today is to ask you to, to pray and ask the Lord to reveal to you, let's make this personal. Is there any way, Lord, that my worship of you is dross? Is there any way that I'm being hypocritical in my worship of you, that I'm outwardly worshiping, but inwardly my heart is, is far from you? And God's spirit, God loves you, and God's spirit desires for us to be um, in right fellowship with God, in right relationship with God, and he convicts of sin. He convicts of truth and righteousness. He convicts of sin. And when we know what God's word says, then we must agree. Lord, I confess before you, I agree with you, that what you have shown me is sin, and I repent of that. And Lord, please forgive me. And now, help me to follow you in that. And, and y'all, that frees us to worship. That frees us to come before the Lord with genuine, authentic worship. Now, it doesn't fix you so you can never sin again. <laughs> have you discovered that? <laughs> but he does give us a desire to know the father and to love god and to love jesus and to do so with obedience to our lives so that we don't shun his word and we don't shun his ways but we actually seek those paths that he has before us and his word is a lamp unto that path and so on that's that's one way that we can know that we're walking with the lord is when we hunger for his word and hunger for it, not just for knowledge, but for obedience as an as a act of our love for him. So that's that's chapter six. Let me ask you, is there anything you'd like to, to share or, or insights that you gleaned from, from your study over this week? I always worry about, there, there had to be some good people there, but they get sucked up with all the others. Can't that be true? Not every, surely not every single person in Jerusalem <laughs> was no longer uh, worshipful of God. Well, I know that God, there's, there's always a remnant that have, have been faithful. Even back when we were talking about right. um, Elijah and there were 7,000 that didn't bow, bow their knee to the prophet, even though it seemed like nobody in Israel worshiped God. Um, his judgment is thorough on Jerusalem and Israel, but there are going to be a people who are his. So, um, whether they came from Judah or Israel, there were going to be a people, you know, whose hearts weren't turned. But, and that's, a, that's actually brings up a good point because there's a lie that we can convince ourselves that our, my sin doesn't affect anybody else. 
that it's okay. I mean, but my sin really doesn't affect you. And that's a lie because my sin does affect people around me, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And if there were, if there was anyone in Jerusalem who had a heart for the Lord, um, they were still impacted by the judgment that was coming against God, against Judah, against Jerusalem. They were impacted by that. Um, I know that God's saying here, you know, he's, he's, it's almost reminiscent of Abraham when he's, you know, he's, he's saying, Lord, is there one, you know, is there 10 people left? And if there's 10 people left in Sodom, then would you mm -hmm. withhold your judgment? Um, God knows the hearts of everyone. And he is saying here, um, their, 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 their rebellion is complete. So whether it means there's, there's all or most, I, I, I'm not going to die on that heel because <laughs> I don't want to speak for the Lord, but I know um, God's heart is that Jerusalem, obviously Jeremiah was one, right? He didn't walk on water, but he had a heart for the Lord and is trying to proclaim his people. So he was one. Mm -hmm. And even he was caught up in the judgment of God because we know he, he watched the, the siege of, of Jerusalem. And later he was captured and taken to Egypt. Sleep. Sleep. So we know there was at least one. One person asleep. That's a that's a good insight. Not sleep. Anybody else? Well, next week. Can I ask you about next week? Um, I am actually leaving on vacation tomorrow and coming back next Tuesday, and so I'll be gone out of town. And I don't want to miss next week. Although my study for chapter seven is um probably going to be very limited so i'd like to ask if we could that we would meet next wednesday and especially for a time of prayer and um and hold off on talking about chapter seven definitely read chapter seven and and let's um, have a bible study together on that two weeks from today but next week if we can meet for prayer and then um i will put out one question about your relationship with the lord you personally a testimony question about you that we can just have a time of fellowship and, and, and sharing um, testimony next week. It won't be long. It'll, it'll be a simple question. And it may be something like, you know, when's the time that you saw the Lord answer your prayer in a way that you did not expect? Something, something where you in your, in your relationship with the Lord. Um, or when's the struggle that you faced that God came through in a way that um, you knew it, was, it had to be him? Um, so if that's okay, if we can have a prayer and fellowship time next week, mm -hmm. and then we'll do chapter 7. The following week. The one reason I'm saying that is because I'm also preaching, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So I'm, I'm giving study to that as well. I'll prepare for that here on the 25th. And chapter seven is such a crucial chapter in Jeremiah. It's probably one of the most famous um, messages that Jeremiah has because it's, it's called the temple sermon. And it's where he is exposing, God is exposing the, the, the the huge hypocrisy, even in his temple there in Jerusalem. So I don't want to, um, I, I really want us to give, give a good attention to that. Uh, so if that's okay, that's what we'll do next week. And uh, so you'll get the same link, same channel, you know, same, same back channel. We'll come here and we'll, we'll pray together. And then I'll um, also have some testimony time together as well. All right. With that said, let me pray for us and we'll be done for today. Father, I do thank you for your mercy. Lord, it's difficult to read um, Jeremiah and the messages that he proclaimed to Jerusalem and to Judah because of the rebellious hearts against you, God. And yet, Lord, it's so reflective of our own hearts, our own selfish hearts, when we um, allow our sinfulness to, to be our king. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to to recognize that your spirit will convict us. I pray you help us to recognize when our hearts are rebelling against you or apathetic, that we, as if we're have our fingers in our ears saying, Lord, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you. Please forgive us, God. Please capture our hearts. May your spirit convict us of sin in our lives that we can confess and repent and be uh, forgiven of the sin and our fellowship be restored that we can walk in your ways and we can hear your word and your spirit speak to our hearts and that we can live and proclaim the kingdom of God with our lives and with our words. I thank you for my brothers and my sisters in Christ. And I pray that you continue to help us deepen in our walk with you. 
And I surely love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank y'all so much for being here. I surely love you in the Lord, and I hope y'all have a great rest of this week. Thank you, and have a good vacation. Thank you so much. Vacation. I appreciate that. Going to spend a little bit of that time with some grandbabies, so it's it's going to be good. That'll be fun. Y'all have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see you before then. I'll see you next Wednesday. Ah.